Hey folks, Adam Sparks, Covenant Horst, co-chair of the local chapter and giver of small speeches, it appears. Uh, I am very excited for this next panel, and granted I'm a little biased because our firm has uh, some involvement in one of the cases you're going to learn a lot more about from, uh, from Bruce in just a minute, but I have a couple of housekeeping matters I want to cover. First of all, Molly will be back at the end of the panel to talk about lunch and other things associated with lunch. Get excited for that. Uh, second, if you need CLE, if you haven't scanned in for this session yet, or uh, perhaps for others, I'm not exactly sure how it works, rush me in the corner, wave rush me. Hi, rush me. Uh, Rajmi can take care of that for you if you are willing to fill out an evaluation form or to turn those in that you've already completed. Please give them to her as well. Uh, also, Debbie Gonzalez kindly got the State Bar folks to open the State Bar Museum. Uh, it's actually a pretty small but very interesting museum here at the State Bar. If you've got a few minutes, I recommend you check it out. The exhibit is called A Mirror to History, Famous Georgia and U.S. Trials, and for the competitive among you, yes, there is a quiz at the end. So if you go around out here to the left, it's a very nice little museum. Uh, no food or drink, please. You can also just talk to my partner, Palsy Knapp, who is the president of the 11th Circuit Historical Society. You can have food or drink around him. Uh, he has forgotten more than I will ever know about Georgia law, so I recommend that, too. Uh, finally, you may notice that Brian is not Senator Elena Parent. Senator Parent and her backup, who is also a state legislator, each had a conflict today. Brian has graciously agreed to pinch hit. Because you don't know a lot about him, because he's not in your program, I wanted to share a little bit about Brian's background and his expertise. Uh, Brian has practiced for over 20 years in the field of election law. He's done so on behalf of the ACLU, the Department of Justice. He currently does so in private practice at the law office of Brian L. Sells here in Atlanta. Uh, just this week, he filed a notice of appeal in the 11th Circuit on behalf of the Libertarian Party of Georgia challenging restrictive ballot access laws that are being challenged for uh, candidacy for the United States House of Representatives. If that wasn't enough, he just traveled to DC to testify before a subcommittee of the House Judiciary Committee to talk about the need for greater protections of voting rights in Indian country. Uh, and thankfully, he had time to step in and serve for us in this capacity as well. On a personal note, he also helped some schmo who went to the same law school that he did kind of figure out how to be a lawyer here in Atlanta four or five years ago, bottom lunch in Inman Park, and I have a good authority that that schmo is still grateful today. So with that, I will hand it off to Brian Sells, who will introduce our Cracker Jack panel here. Thank you. Thank you. Th thanks, Adam. And uh, I'm delighted to uh, stand in for Senator Parent. She is my state senator and stands up for me uh, in the state legislature, so I'm glad to be able to return the favor. I'm going to introduce uh, very briefly our panelists, and uh, then they will speak one by one. And uh, I will add some questioning at the end uh, of their talks, and then we will open it up to questioning from the audience. Uh, immediately to my left is April England Albright. She is a supervising attorney at the Department of Education's Office of Civil Rights, but she's here today to, uh, to talk about the Black Voters Matter Fund, where she is a member of the Board of Advisors. Um, she's also a civil rights attorney who's been doing this for, I believe, also more than 20 years. So we we'll look forward to her talk there. Immediately to her left is my longtime colleague, Nancy Abudu, who is now Deputy Legal Director uh, for the Southern Poverty Law Center's new voting rights practice group, and she'll tell you about that. Uh, but immediately before that, she was the legal director of the ACLU of Florida. And before that, uh, we worked together at the ACLU's Voting Rights Project, which was here in Atlanta at the time. Uh, to her left is Jackie Colon, who's the Southeast Regional Director of the Naleo Educational Fund. That's the National Association of Latino Elected and Appointed Officials. Uh, she has been one herself as deputy mayor of the city of uh, Palm Bay, Florida, and she was, I believe, the first person of color elected to the Brevard County Commission. Do I have that right? Yes, sir. And, uh, and served as chair of that commission at one point. Um, and all the way at the other end of the table uh, is my fellow solo practitioner, Bruce Brown, um, who is an attorney at law in the law firm of Bruce P. Brown Law. He, <laughs> it's a clever name. <laughs> well, so we, we think up the most interesting names for our solo practices. Um, and I, I is it back on?
Oh, it's, it's back on now? Okay. Um, before that, uh, before starting his own firm, Bruce was with uh, McKenna Long and Aldridge for many years. And uh, so, April, let me turn it over to you. Oh, wow, I'm first. I thought I was last on the list. <laughs> uh, hi, I'm April, and um, I advise uh, the organization Black Voters Matter Fund. I'm one of their advisors. I give consultant because it's work that I've always done, even though currently that's not the focus of the work that I do. And I'm going to be very careful because my director is actually here. So <laughs> I'm going to be much more behaved than I had initially planned to be. Uh, but um, what I'm here to talk about today, and on behalf of my husband, who is one of the co-founders of Black Voters Matter Fund, and Latasha Brown, who is his partner, is this is an organization that originally was conceived over 20 years ago. Um, we worked in a town called Selma, Alabama, for those, if, if you know where that is. And we were, I was a starting attorney, and my husband and Latasha were starting organizers <laughs> and development, working in development as well. And so we wanted to go to Selma and just continue the good work, right? Um, to our amazement when we went there and to our surprise, um, the community looked the same. And so we spent about 10 years it, 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 was, it looked the same so much that the actual mayor, when I first moved to Selma, along with Cliff and Latasha in the year 2000, the same mayor that had called Martin Luther King Martin Luther Kuhn was still mayor. And what was amazing to us is that his practices were the same, and yet the people that were electing him were black voters because Selma, Alabama, was 70% black. So we spent 10 years in that community trying to figure out you know, how we could change that. Because one of the reasons why he continued to be elected was through voter, what people call voter apathy. And so when you look at a place like Selma and you see that people that were in positions of power continued to be people who were not serving the best interests of the majority of people who were living there, that became the question that we decided to work on through organizing on local elections, um, running candidates ourselves, running ourselves, and also creating a third party when we realized that there were attempts to use the Democratic Party as a means also to run through objectives that were not meeting the needs of black people in that community. And when I say it was counter the needs of black people in that community, you could walk over the Edmund Prentiss Bridge, take a picture of Selma, and it would look the same as that picture in 1965. And so the organization is called Black Voters Matter Fund, not Black Votes Matter. And that was intentional because the focus is on the people, right? And part of what we do um, is to go into communities and find ways to help people get involved in changing the community themselves. We're not a traditional civic engagement organizations like people just go in, you know, parachute in and try to increase the number of people who vote on each election cycle. We have a saying that says we go, we work in our communities 365 days a year. That means we don't just show up on national elections when people want to make sure someone gets voted. We work all year to change the participation um, in voting process. But part of that is acknowledging, because one of the questions we were asked is, what do you find the most effective in empowering non-voters? Part of it is not voting shaming, because we understand that most people aren't voting because they don't care, right? So we don't go around saying that people are apathetic, they don't care about their communities. What we first acknowledge is that people are not voting because they understand it absolutely does nothing to change the demographics, to change the power, to change the quality of life that they have. So the first thing we do is acknowledge that's truthful, right? We don't go in and act as if voting is an imaginary fixer. Because the people who actually fought to vote right, who died on the bridge in the community that we lived in for 10 years, did so because they wanted to get more access, right? They wanted to get, be able to practice their citizenship more. And so voting was not just some ritual, it was supposed to be a changer for quality of life. So the first thing we know is the reason why people are not voting is because they understand the truth 
that voting is not changing. Even if they vote someone who may look like them, it doesn't translate to more jobs. It doesn't translate to better roads or better schools or more access. So it's truthful. And so what we try to do is find a way to talk and engage communities to help them identify what are the needs that you, that you see in your community that needs to be changed. And then cultivate your own leadership to do that. And so we're not party driven because at the end of the day, if an individual, whomever party or no party, is going to create and work within your community to bring forth the things you want to change, then that's the person that should be supported. So that is what we spend 365 days doing, is one, identifying people already in local communities who are doing their own version of civic engagement, even if it doesn't look like what we traditionally think. In other words, they're just out there just pushing voter registration cards. Even if they're an organization that's dealing with one specific issue around education, or ballot access, or police brutality, or whatever that looks like, we find those groups. And the next thing we do is we give them resources. That's why it's called Black Voters Matter Fund. Because one of the other things that we find is that the number of money, the resources that go into marginalized communities in comparison to communities who are not marginalized, it's night and day. And so what we do is we find these organizations and then we give them resources to put might behind the work that they're doing. And so usually the way the election cycle works, right, if there's a presidential year, if there's a governor high stake election, then resources will flow. But what happens outside of those years? And by the time the money comes, it's too late. It is too late. And so what we try to do is give people money throughout the year so they can do the very important work of knocking on the doors of their neighbors. Which brings me to the last point, is that our partners are not national organizations. We identify partners who actually live in the community, right? Who know the neighbors, who know the issues, who are going to be directly impacted by what decisions are, are leadership that's selected. So we find those groups. We reach out, we meet with them, and we ask them, what's important to you, and how can we support you? And that's not always money, right? Sometimes money is an easy solution. It helps them buy more print cards or helps them have signs. But we also provide technical assistance, because a lot of times with social media, a lot of small rural communities, they're not tapped into that. And so what we do, we are able to offer an auxiliary to their work and amplify their voices by you know, offering tech services, offering tech services, offering phone banks through our own infrastructure to help them have a further bandwidth reach. And so those are just some of the things that we notice and we've seen actually works in having people empowered and engaged. And in 2017, when uh, Roy Moore was running for office as the senator in Alabama, we were like, and that's my home. Alabama is my home. So I was like, not on my watch. And so, you know, we went in and we used this formula, right? Organized in small communities. And as the, at the end of the night, when people were worried that Roy Moore might pull it off, we knew that wasn't true because we saw the counties that were still outstanding. And one of the counties that was still outstanding was Selma, Alabama. And it was Selma, Alabama that put Roy Moore over the top. And what happened was the same formula that I just presented, giving people resources, helping them go and connect to their neighbors, and they say, you need to go vote, not April, Joe Blow from wherever, but the neighbor who goes to church with them, you need to go vote, and they know where the people, where the bodies lie and where the people are you know, not voting. They go drive and pick them up and take them. They're the local board of electorates, and those are the kind of things that help change. And so when one asks about how do you make a voter that is non-voter to being voter? Listen to them. Don't shame them. And that's, that's Black Voters Matter. And the last thing I'll say is we are not just limited to Georgia, not just Alabama. We travel in 11 states, and we do this same work in communities. And we've seen phenomenal outcomes. And not always just getting a person in office and not. Sometimes it's getting a ballot initiative. Um, one of the proudest things that we worked on in Florida this past year um, was making sure that the ballot initiative that restored and allowed for felons, we were a part of that work. 
And so we did the same thing in Louisiana. So it's not always about getting somebody on the ballot, although that's important, but it's also about issues. We are working right now in Albany, Georgia, around utility issues because we find that poor communities, as you probably know, their homes don't have the infrastructure. And so as a result, the amount of money that they're charged with right, to live day to day looks a lot different than you and I. And so that becomes another issue that we organize on. We create warrant clinics where we actually um, go into communities and we find ways where people are not participating the, in the voting process because they don't have a valid driver's license anymore, because they had a ticket or a fine that they can't pay. So we work with local municipalities to figure out ways to bring people in in a less punitive way, reduce their fines and court costs so that they can actually um, get their licenses back and they can feel, be full citizen full citizens again and use those rights. And the last thing I will say is there was a question about what do we do and how it intersects with voting and how it intersects with legal and what a lot of you will be talking about. Um, well, a lot of times through the work that we do, we get to identify plaintiffs. The co-founder of uh, Black Voters Matter Fund, Latasha, actually was a client of his. And she served as one of the plaintiffs who helped to finally get Kemp to resign last year when he was, you know, steering the election in many regards. And so in many times we can find plaintiffs, we can serve as plaintiffs in these cases, we can go out in the community and remind people that these, this is what voter suppression looks like and these are the kind of things that you can do to arm yourself as a community, making sure that your names are on the, you know, the voting rolls and haven't been removed, how you can go to the secretary's website and check. We also make sure that they have information about if you go to a poll and they tell you your name is not there and you can't vote, that you can use provisional ballots and this is how you can make sure at least that your vote is memorialized. So we also do things like that to help shape, and we, we, find, we find cases. The last year, one of the biggest cases that made the cycles was we went to Jefferson County. Um, and there was a group of elderly African Americans who were going to take a bus that we were sponsoring and they ended up being told that they could not ride that bus, even though they were private citizens, they were not residents of a particular nursing home or facility. So that became a national issue to bring, to amplify better for those who are in court. These are the things that are happening on the ground to suppress the vote. It doesn't look like it used to look when Bill Horn was sitting in the door saying you can't vote. There are other ways that it's happening. And so through our work on the ground, we develop the narratives that are necessary to feed SELU, to feed SPLC, so that we can have their, our voices amplified in court when necessary. So there's many ways that on the ground work supports legal cases. And remember, most of the rights that were afforded to marginalized communities did not come as a result of someone voting at the ballot. It was a result of people organizing themselves and empowering themselves. And so we can never lose sight of that, and Black Voters Matter amplifies that. We work alongside attorneys and help to get some remedies in court, but as you all know in this space, that's changing. Common cause check case changed a lot of the tools that we can use to talk about gerrymandering and other forms of how our voting rights are impacted. So we need to recognize as lawyers that we have to make sure that whatever it is that we're talking about is of harm, right, or injury in the court cases, that the community supports it. And if we do that, if we connect the on the ground work with what's happening in our legal angel organizations, what that means is we get Brown versus Board of Education, right? Because the courts know that this is the will of the people. We'll continue, even as we sit here frightened about what's going to happen at the end of this term with Title VII and Title IX in the capacity of gender, if the people are crying out about it, if they know that it's in court, we will have a court who will understand that, that, that Americans want to make sure that people and their gender rights are protected. So that is kind of how we see Black Voters Matter Fund working on the ground, on the door to door, getting people to participate more <coughs> and getting their power and their voices heard, but also how we can facilitate lawyers in keeping the case in the history and tradition of changing and, <coughs> and making the Constitution have a little bit more bandwidth and breadth. That's how our work connects.
Wow. <laughs> so much to dig into there. Uh, you heard April talk about Amendment 4 in Florida, and that's a great segue uh, over to Nancy, who uh, has been involved in that, that litigation following up on Amendment 4. So go, take it away, Nancy. Thank you, Brian, and thank you, April. I am so inspired by the work that you're doing, and that is part of the reason why SPLC created the Voting Rights Practice Group. We're brand new, as Brian indicated, <laughs> just opened in February, and in part it was because there was a vacuum in terms of organizations, national organizations in particular that were investing the necessary funds and human resources in terms of advancing voting rights in the Deep South and making sure that we don't forget the Deep South. There's a lot of energy and direction being um, direct or directed towards Ohio and Wisconsin and these other places that are viewed as really battleground states. But we're saying that when we look at what happened with the Abrams campaign in Georgia, the Gillum campaign in Florida, that we can do it in the Deep South if we, again, invest the resources necessary to make that political progressive change. So SPLC decided to do just that, invest its resources in creating a brand new practice group. We're small, but I say mighty. There's six of us now, and most of us are not attorneys. And myself and we have one other lawyer on staff right now, but most of the folks are field organizers who are going on the ground to do the kind of work that April discussed, not only directly, but also through organizations that we can support in terms of advancing that kind of work. And also you'll see it in terms of our profile. I mean, of course, we're going to continue to do litigation. We're going to continue to do legislative advocacy, but we're really trying to put more momentum behind a field program and the GOTV or Get Out the Vote and Get Out the Count programs. And while it's absolutely true that voting in and of itself cannot create automatically the change that we need to see, and engaging with voters, we're trying to connect the dots to say that that is a start. Political activism and recognizing that your vote is your voice is a start. And so for those who don't face any real legal obstacle when it comes to voting, making sure that apathy and the disinformation that leads oftentimes to that apathy does not become a real serious barrier in terms of actually voting. And then also emphasizing that it doesn't end with voting. I mean, once we we put these folks in office, we have to hold them accountable. So not just going to your, um, you know, in-district meetings or going to your lobby days, but making sure that they see and hear you every day and reminding them that the power is with the people. And so if they do not hold up the promises that they made when they were running for office, that they will hear from us during the next election cycle, and that recounts and recalls and all of those things exist in the in-between time, and that we should be taking advantage of that as well. In terms of Amendment 4, I'm very happy to share that just late le yes, yesterday ma afternoon, we got a, a very important victory from the Northern District of Florida, which granted in part a preliminary injunction to block Florida's law, Senate Bill 7066, from going into effect against our clients. Now, this is a law that was a direct effort to undermine the will of 5.1 million people, Floridians, who voted last November to automatically restore voting rights to people with criminal convictions. This is an area that is especially especially important to me because, as Brian knows, I really started my career in the voting rights arena working on rights restoration and trying to incorporate, to some extent, a movement law framework in that and saying that, number one, you shouldn't be able to deny someone the right to vote simply because they have a conviction and the courts rejecting that argument by saying, well, it's enshrined in Section 2 of the 14th Amendment that says you can deny someone the right to vote for conviction or participation in rebellion or other crime. And so we said, okay. Well, during that time, we didn't have the proliferation of crimes that we have today when even in Florida, believe it or not, releasing a certain number of balloons into the air is a, cr in a criminal offense that can result in your loss, the loss of your right to vote. And the court saying, well, you know, 
the kind of going back to Professor Siegel's argument, this originalist theory has some flexibility, so maybe you didn't have crimes like that during the period that the 14th Amendment was enacted, but we have to move with the times and make it relevant today. So then we said, okay, well, what about the restrictions that are placed on who can restore their voting rights? And that got us to the financial penalties that are imposed on people and saying that, well, before you can vote, you at least have to pay your fines and your fees and your court costs and your restitution and any other thing that we can tack on to make sure that we fund our criminal justice system on the backs of poor people, that you have to satisfy all of those obligations before you can be able to vote, that that in and of itself is unconstitutional. And the courts are saying, well, you know, we're not saying that you have to pay fines and fees before you can vote. We're just saying that you have to satisfy or totally complete your sentence. And if your fines and fees are part of your sentence, then that's not, then you have to satisfy those as well. So it's your sentence, not the fees in and of themselves. And so then we said, okay, what about people who can't afford to pay fines and fees? Let's try to incorporate some of the framework or standards from the criminal justice system, looking at cases like Gideon v. Wainwright mm -hmm. and Bearden, George, uh, Bearden v. Georgia, which say that before you can really penalize someone or deny someone the right to counsel, because they can't afford it, you at least have to establish that they really cannot afford it. Therefore, you can't deny them a right to counsel simply because they're poor, or you can't reincarcerate them simply because they're poor. And the courts have been more open to those kinds of arguments, and that's what we saw yesterday in Judge Hinkle's decision out of, again, the Northern District of Florida, where he criticized Florida system, which does not allow for that kind of evidentiary hearing. Now, I would, of course, would have liked the court to have gone a little farther and said that, yes, requiring people to pay financial obligations as a condition to vote is a poll tax, but we're not there yet. And so I think that it's so interesting that you talk about in terms of gender equality and what was mentioned earlier today about gender discrimination is that we're seeing that in the voting rights context as well. My clients are low income African American women who already entered the criminal justice system at a financial disadvantage. And when you look at how as women we can continue to get paid less, we continue to be valued less, and in fact, we are becoming more represented statistically in the criminal justice system than any other population to require us to then pay money as a condition to get our rights restored means that for the most part, we are never ever going to be able to vote and therefore are completely permanently blocked out of our democracy. And when we look at the role that women have played, especially black women, if you want to talk about the Doug Jones race and you want to talk a little bit about the pushback against President Trump, that black women in particular have been standing up and holding the line in terms of making sure that we don't go too far back in our history in terms of repression. You couple that with a law like Florida's that would ultimately deny that kind of access, we have to remain vigilant in challenging it. And then that also brings up the issue of constitutional amendments that haven't been used very often, like the 19th Amendment, that says you cannot deny someone the right to vote based on their sex or gender, and yet you have a law that at the end of the day will disproportionately impact people based on their sex or gender. So that is a theory that we're really trying to advance as well. In terms of the questions that we were also at, that I was also asked to consider, um, you know, we have to look at, of course, the loss of the coverage formula from the Voting Rights Act. A lot of people like to say, well, we don't have Section 5, which was a law that requires states with a history of discrimination in voting to at least get federal approval before they can enact any such law. Section 5 technically still exists. What we don't have is the coverage formula to say which jurisdictions are required to comply with Section 5. And so the Supreme Court's decision in June 2013 was a serious blow. That's not just a general talking point. 
point. We saw that immediately after the court issued its decision, Alabama enacted a photo ID law that says that you have to present a picture ID before you can vote. But you can get this picture ID at a DMV office. And then they turned around and closed over 80 DMV offices in predominantly minority communities. So again, the creativity with which they are enacting these voter suppression laws has to be matched by our creativity as litigators, as organizers, as legislative advocates in terms of pushing back. We saw again what happened with Texas, another photo ID law, something that people think is so innocuous. Everybody probably in this room has a photo ID, but we were able to show that hundreds of thousands of people in places like Texas and Alabama and South Carolina don't have a voter ID. A client of mine in South Carolina, for example, whose birth was recorded in a family Bible, and then the house caught on fire and the family Bible was destroyed. He does not have any evidence that he exists other than the fact that he is living and breathing and able to physically present himself. But the state of South Carolina would have denied him the right to vote simply because he didn't have an ID and he didn't have the underlying documents to get the ID. So these are the types of laws and the reasons why we have to look very carefully behind not only the motivation but the implementation when it comes to these types of restrictions. And so being with SPLC now, doing this kind of work, joining these folks on the panel, I'm very excited about the work that we're going to be doing. And to also note that it doesn't end with 2020. Right after the November election, then we're on the heels of the 2021 redistricting cycle. And as some of you know, we're still litigating cases from the 2010 redistricting cycle. So it doesn't end. Our, our work and the efforts on the other side to make sure that even though their numbers are shrinking, that their power continues to be consolidated and strengthened is serious. And so again, we have to meet that and put all of our efforts behind battling it and making sure that they are unsuccessful in their efforts. Nancy raised redistricting there at the end that is looming large like a dark storm cloud um, <laughs> over us. Uh, and uh, that's a great segue into what Jackie's going to talk about. Jackie, why don't you take it away? Yes. Uh, good morning, almost noon. I'm Jackie Colon, Naleo Educational Fund. Um, what an honor to be here with these ladies, my heroes, my new best friends, <laughs> because we have a lot to talk about. As they mentioned in regards to redistricting, we hear a lot of discussions regarding the census. So what I did was I brought a little PowerPoint, just for those who probably, uh, I have a feeling this room knows a lot about the census and, re and redistricting, but let's go ahead and give it a try. Let me share a little bit of who we are in the Leo Educational Fund. We have um, our, our mission, uh, three major strategies, policy, research, and advocacy. They're out of DC. Constituency services, our folks are out of LA. And I belong to the Civic Engagement Department. I've been with Naleo now for over a decade, which meant that about 10 years ago, I was also part of working the census. I was Miss Census in the state of Florida. And folks thought that I worked for the Census Bureau because that's all I talked about. And the reason why is because it's very personal with me. And um, as these ladies were, were just, I was just here at all. I could hear them this whole afternoon, just continuing to hear the amazing work that they're doing. That's why I said they're going to be my new best friends. They don't know it yet. Um, because uh, when, when you mentioned Dr. King, it's very personal with me uh, because I came to this country and I didn't speak a word of English. Mm. And... Oh, I'm sorry. sorry. The elementary I went to in Jersey City, New Jersey, was named after Dr. King. And every year I would study about Dr. King. And he made me believe that I could go after a dream. Mm. Mm. All right, let's get back to the track now. <laughs> so the Lord has a sense of humor. And he says, yeah, that little one from uh, Ecuador who didn't speak a word of English is going to be among a room of heroes. Because I heard everything that you folks do. And you're in the trenches. And you're my hero. So 
when I hear a bio and you see all that fancy bio there and I pinch myself and I go, wow, the Lord does have a sense of humor. But he, he absolutely, um, uh, we're living our purpose, I believe. Now, Leo is a, is a organization that has been around for over 40 years and there's about 6,000 of us, a membership. And I became part of Naleo um, over 15 years ago when I became the first uh, minority elected official in Bavar County. That's where the space shuttle goes off. And if anybody has been to Bavar County, they don't look like me. <laughs> <laughs> they don't. So as you can imagine, when folks used to come from the Pentagon and Washington and wanted to speak to the folks in NASA, and they wanted to speak to the chairman of the Board of County Commissioners, and they see Jackie Colon. Thank you so much, Molly. Oh my gosh, do not take pictures, cut the video. <laughs> um, when they came and they wanted to speak to the chairman of the Board of County Commissioners in Brevard County, uh, and, uh, and I was sitting right there and, and the Brigadier Generals and so forth, they're like, well, where is Commissioner Colon? He's obviously not here. <laughs> it was a room full of men and uh, and there was this little Latina right there in the corner uh, looking at my chief of staff, who's a man, and going like this to him. Don't say anything. Don't say anything. And it was nice when it was time to start the meeting, and I was able to say to all these nice folks, you know, would you gentlemen be so kind and uh, take a seat? I would like to start my meeting on time. <laughs> and uh, everybody turned red or pale or whatever shade. Um, and so it's, it's just amazing. The census is very important, folks. Um, Naleo has folks that, that, uh, that come to our national conference. As you can see, uh, we're a nonpartisan organization. Um, extremely proud of that because, um, as April mentioned, you know, our vote should never be taken for granted by any party. And I think it's really important to discuss that. Uh, redistricting is very important. The census, as we know, in regards to Article 1, Section 2, uh, uh, the Census Bureau is bound by Title 13 of the United States Code. But with the citizenship question, as you can imagine, the damage has been done. And I'm going to bring you full circle real quickly because you said, well, why, how, how can the damage be done? Well, everyone is supposed to be counted. Everyone, whether you're documented or documented, everyone is supposed to be counted. And as you can see, um, our, our country continues to grow very, very fast um, with the immigrant community continuing to, to grow. And we're just not talking about Latinos. I come from Florida. And so we have our, our Haitian brothers and sisters. Um, we have folks that come from all over uh, the Caribbean, and, and the community continues to. Why is the census important? The census data are the basis of our representative, uh, representative democracy, uh, protection of civil rights, billions in federal dollars, and also to make sure uh, it is used to inform decisions. As a former elected official, I was an elected official for 15 years. I started at the city level and then became a county commissioner. And these dollars were critical for me to be able to make decisions. As I mentioned, the community did not look like me. So therefore, um, it was kind of like one out of five all the time. Uh, and I was very passionate about working with the needy for those who didn't have a voice. And so, I knew that those dollars that were going to be coming from the census were critical because everybody, the, the, the numbers that come in, they don't follow the need. They only follow the census data. You need to remember that. It doesn't follow the need. It's just based on the population. And so um, the, the, the critical part is of the dollars that come into a community. And so therefore, when folks try to make this a partisan issue, they're highly mistaken because everybody's shooting themselves in the foot if they don't. Why do we count? Why do we, uh, why do we conduct a redistricting? Each district must have the same number of residents. Okay, now picture this. Over time, districts become uneven in size. Okay? They become uneven in size. And every 10 years, the district lines have to be redrawn to make each district even in size again, and it's based on census data. Census information will show the population if the population has increased, whether it has decreased, or whether it stays the same. And those in the Midwest and in the Northeast, y'all in trouble because y'all are decreasing. You're coming down here. <laughs> you're coming to Georgia. You're coming to Florida. You're going to Texas. And so what does that mean? That means that as, they, as we continue to grow, that makes it even more important. And you're going to see why it's a full circle. So 
After the 2020 census that's going to be happening next year, our nation will have new information about the size of the population in each state and in each community. Okay? So if you're going to have new, again, right, the, the numbers have increased through the, throughout the, the last 10 years, so now we're going to see, well, how many do we have? And not only that, now we have to make them even. So every 10 years this happens. The census will be used to draw what kind of lines? Really important lines. So they make them all even, and now they say, what does this mean? The draw lines for congressional seats, state, and local government districts. So now you know why there's a certain folks that really don't want the census to be accurate. <gasps> I wonder why. Well, look at this, gentlemen, ladies and gentlemen. This is why. Distribution of electoral votes. Mm -hmm. That's what the census does. But you don't hear about it too much, right? Mm -mm. You don't hear about it because everybody's, all oh, the billions of dollars that come into the community and all that, which is very important. And remember, that's the dollars that, 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 uh, that absolutely come to the community that we need. But the distribution of electoral votes is critical. Electoral votes are allocated among the states based on the census. And this is the math. Every state is allocated a number of votes equal to the number of senators and representatives in its U.S. congressional delegation. Two votes for the senators and in the U.S. Senate plus a number of votes equal to the number of its members of the U.S. House of Representatives. What does that mean? That means that Florida is looking at gaining two more, which means that by the 2024, there will be 31 electoral votes if everyone in the state of Florida makes sure that they're counted. But if my community, and I don't mean Latinos, I'm talking about my community, meaning uh, people of color, my Asian community, my Muslim brothers and sisters, if they're afraid to uh, be counted, they're gonna stay home and not, not, not uh, open that door for that enumerator or fill, in, uh, fill the information that's needed because they're worried. And they themselves probably have papers, but maybe someone in their family does not. And so what happens? That that number is not accurate. And what does that mean? That that community will not get the dollars that they need, and just as important, the representation that's going to be needed. And look where, where the billions of dollars go to. The community that everyone in this room is talking about. Medicaid. We're talking about Head Start. We're talking about lunch uh, dollars for children. These are things that are, that as I mentioned, it was really personal to me because, yes, we talk about, you know, Jackie Colon being the, the chairman of the Board of County Commissioners, but nobody talks about Jackie Colon, the one that was homeless. Mm. Mm. Jackie Colon, that the only food that she was able to eat during those, it was a lunch program. And that my family would pray that it would be uh, the summer lunch program. Right? So the Lord didn't put me here just to look cute, okay? He put me here to work. <laughs> Yes, he did. And so when I turn around and I think of the little Latina, right, that would go hungry at times, I'm looking at my district, my state, and I'm looking at Miami-Dade, 18,000 children undercounted. Look at Broward, 6,000. You start doing the math, that means that every single child that was not counted, that community lost $2,000 per year per child, multiply that times 10. Two times 10 per person, and we only get one shot at it. That doesn't come back. So the young children at risk of being undercounted are the communities that we work with. Look at all that. Rentals, young households, low incomes, limited English speaking, live with the grandparents, and so on. So Naleo put together a commission that went across the entire country wanting to get testimonials because we knew we were going to be ending up in court, right? And so for organizations, we're, we, we we're not a, a, a legal organization, but what we do is we give it to good folks like my sisters over here who are able to go, here you go, here's the baton, you run with it, right? Because they're going to need all that information. They're going to need good concrete uh, testimonies and, and evidence. And so for the last uh, year and a half, we've been going around the community, also getting folks to be educated on the complete count committees that are needed in our community. Children are very close and dear to our heart because they're not being counted, so we have an Asme Contar campaign. And uh, uh, the way that uh, folks are going to be participating 
Uh, just to give you a timeline of when they will be coming, they will, there's three ways of you being able to, to participate. You're gonna be able to uh, do it uh, via the internet. That's the way we all get on now. You're able to even call or you're able to do it uh, in writing. These are key campaign peak dates. Uh, we've been at this for a year and a half now. We've been educating all our elected officials because as you can imagine, the 10, 10 years ago, the same elected officials were not there. So we're having to teach brand new elected officials the importance of, uh, of the census. And um, that is our campaign. Um, we're uh, working extremely hard to make sure and every single one of us um, has to do our part. You're doing yours. Just com uh, continue to spread the word of the importance of the census. It's not just about the dollars. It's about our representation. Mm -hmm. If you don't know, Bruce is uh, lead counsel on uh, a landmark case here in Georgia dealing with voting machines, among other things. And so Bruce, tell us about that case and, and what it means for our voting rights, both in Georgia and nationally. Thanks, Brian. Uh, the case that um, I and a team of lawyers, including several who are here, have been working on is called the Curling Case. Um, and in the Curling Case, um, we took on the state of Georgia's um, old and vulnerable electronic voting system, the touch voting system. Uh, and claimed uh, under the First and Fourteenth uh, Amendment that it denied people the right to vote and the right to have your vote counted. Um, and we substantially prevailed in the lawsuit overall. The, um, and the, just to give you a, a brief overview of just the history of the case, at first we challenged the old, um, they're called DREs, and these are the, the plastic, sort of cheap-looking voting machines that you vote on in Georgia. Uh, and you have for about 10 years that they put in nationwide after the horrible, pro horrible problems, sorry, in Florida uh, in that presidential election many years ago. Uh, and so it was an effort to make voting better, but it, it actually failed because the, uh, the DRE voting machines are vulnerable to cyber attacks. And mo most important is they are not auditable. Uh, once the thing about the, the challenges to um, voting systems, and the key to our case is that, is that of all the transactions, the electronic transactions that we all engage in using computers, um, the, the exercise of voting is the most fleeting. Mm. And there is no other uh, record of your vote uh, except that moment where you touch that screen. And so if you don't have a record of that, then your vote can easily be lost and you will never know it. And so if you talk to computer scientists and voting specialists, particularly the more advanced the computer scientists, the more angry they are that we would use that system for such a precious resource, uh, a, a precious uh, value as voting, is that why are you using a computer to do that? So our, and I'll, I'll talk to you a little bit about more clients and, and all the people involved in these cases, but the, the basic idea is, is that the courts are saying that votes are, are precious. You can see that in all these cases. Um, my favorite is Yikwo versus Hopkins, uh, which says, this is a 150-year-old case, Brian, mm -hmm. probably? Yeah. 1880-something. 1880s, yeah. Yeah. And at Yikwo, they said voting is a foundational right because it's the basis for all other rights. And then you have case after case saying that the, <clears throat> excuse me, the right to vote is precious. Uh, and I like, I like the word precious because it, it means both uh, valuable and fragile. And <clears throat> despite all the courts saying that the right to vote is precious, you have it sort of tossed about in states like Georgia, like, you know, Maybe your vote counted, maybe it didn't. Maybe we will count your absentee vote uh, if you're lucky. Maybe we won't. Mm -hmm. And so the translation between these uh, beautifully written Supreme Court decisions over 150 years and the actual administration of the voting systems, uh, there's just a very big gap in that. Uh, our efforts have been uh, uh, nonpartisan. And it's very important for our effort to be nonpartisan in a lot of different, some very practical ways. 
Uh, one is one is that we, we are associated with organizations that have to be nonpartisan. So you have to be careful about, from a representational standpoint, you can't get away from your uh, from your clients and for people that are are funding your clients. Uh, the other point, probably more important, is that there's no reason why voting rights litigation should be partisan at all. Everybody should care about it. Um, because the, the, if there's any partisanship or any sort of bias, it's the party who's in power uh, is going to be abusing uh, voting rights, whether it's Alabama, mm -hmm. whether it's one county or anywhere else. It's the party in power, uh, not necessarily the Democrats uh, or Republicans. Um, and so uh, we've got a collection of lawyers who've been helping on this, and, and um, some of them are libertarian, some of them are Republican, some of them are Democrat. And so it's important to, that, that and, and the judges that you're going to be peering for, we've been lucky enough to have three or four in a row uh, President Obama appointees in the Northern District of Georgia. Uh, but that's not going to always be the case. And so the message needs to be as it should be and as it is that this is a universal right and that it's going to hurt everybody or uh, anybody who wants to vote, regardless of who they want to vote for. Uh, to give you a little more background on the Curling case, we, we succeeded in having um, the use of the old DRE system, where you, you mash your vote on the screen mm -hmm. and it goes away. Who knows if it's counted or not? Uh, Judge Totenberg um, ruled that those are unlawful that they are an unreasonable burden on the right to vote. Uh, then um, Georgia has brought in a new electronic system in which they use ballot marking devices, another electronic device that does this, we, say, we say does the same thing. So we have, we're filing a motion for a preliminary injunction to enjoin that as well. Uh, it's, it's better than the old system, um, but we say it's still not auditable and not verifiable it's too vulnerable, uh, and it's unnecessary. A couple of keys for, for, the, for, for the lawyering of this. I'm a private lawyer. My background is in commercial and constitutional regulatory law, um, first at a big firm and then on a solo practice. The type, these types of cases are more similar for civil lawyers than some of the more specialized areas that you've heard about, like criminal law or, or immigration or criminal, or what, what did she call it? Um, the combination of criminal and immigration. I was listening to that and I was thinking, I couldn't handle those cases. I don't, I, I just am not qualified. And it would take me as a solo practitioner too long um, to learn immigration law or criminal law so that I could jump in and help people that I wanted to help out. It's different for these type of, of big election cases. These actually resemble the type of cases that Halsey or I would be doing um, for other clients. Um, they're big uh, equity cases in federal court. Um, yeah, it's a new area of the law, but every case we have is a new area of the law. It's a new facts, but, you know, that's what you do as a lawyer. And so these are types of cases where firms, when you're challenging an election system or an election process, whether it's absentee voting or something else, is that lawyers that don't have a real deep background, if they're willing to learn a new set of facts like you should be with any case, um, can handle. Uh, you do need the resources to do it, which is a, um, which is a problem, frankly. Um, the funding for these cases is, um, you know, sp spotty sometimes. Um, but what we've been able to do is cobble together a lot of different groups uh, for these cases. My client is the Coalition for Good Governance. It's a terrific organization um, that does grassroots fundraising for these efforts, uh, tries to fund these cases as much as it can, but also provides a ton of support and expertise. We've also... Um, worked with, in one case, on a, on a separate case, not the curling case, but the absentee voting case, we, um, another set of plaintiffs was represented by the ACLU. In another case, um, Project uh, Protect Democracy, an organization you may have heard of, um, helped out. Uh, there's, of course, Fair Fight um, that we are working with in the curling case and other cases. So there's a, there's a host of other organizations that can provide um, support for this. <clears throat> a couple of particular um, sort of uh, aspects of this that are, uh, I think, interesting. One is um, these cases have to be, as April said, 360-day efforts uh, because the problems that you run into in voting cases is that they're big cases. Um, you're trying to replace some sort of uh, 
uh, administration, like in the in the absentee voting cases, you're having the state do something entirely different statewide. Mm -hmm. You better get to them early, or they're not going to be enough time for them to, to fix it in time for the vote. To get it to get to um, to get to them early, you you have to be um, suing them long in advance of the election. We found that out with the with the DREs. It took us a long time to replace them. We finally did. Um, so those you have to really think in advance and be about a year ahead. The other th the other thing uh, that Nancy pointed out is you got to do it year after year. You just got to keep on looking at the different voting systems to seeing where where are they really depriving people of vote. The last thing is is that the theory that we use um, is actually um, I think right, but it's not as hard um, to prove as some other legal theories. Is that our theory is that that if the state gizmo, device, process, administration presents an unreasonable burden on the right to vote without a substantial government interest, then it's a violation of the Constitution. Now, the reason why that's easier is that it does not require, although it many times is, it does not require discriminatory impact. It's just sort of the way I could describe it as see ball, hit ball. Does it make sense? Mm. And if it doesn't, it's unlawful. You don't have to show that it's hurting it's poor people or hurting Democrats uh, or hurting minorities. You just have to show that it's stupid. <laughs> and that's not that hard, especially in a target-rich environment like the state of Georgia. <laughs> um, but we've had a lot of great help from organizations here in, in Atlanta. Um, including the ACLU with Sean Young on the absentee case, uh, Riff Krebel and Horst, um, who are here in the curling case. Um, and so we're, I think we're, we're in a, uh, we're sort of on a roll and, and look forward to more victories down the line. Great. Th thanks, Bruce. I want to try to ask one follow-up question of each of our panelists, um, and I'll start with you again, April. One of the things I love about uh, Black Voters Matter is that you shine a light on rural black mm -hmm. voters, uh, whereas many people tend to focus on mm -hmm. urban uh, mm -hmm. black voters. Can you, can you talk about why you do that and how you do that? Well, um, I, you know, having started the work in a place like Selma, Alabama, which is a rural community, uh, we noticed that there are a lot, no one pays attention to, you know, the small rural communities, not just small rural black communities, but just rural communities in just period. Um, but there are, if you are trying to, you know, if, for example, in state elections, um, it's very important to make sure that every vote is counted and that every vote is, every voter participates. And so there's a lot of bandwidth available in communities that are neglected and not paid attention to. Um, and also too, a lot of the policies that you know, um, like for example, if you're looking at health policy, um, you can see, you can measure the, um, the impact that happens in urban communities, but you have to multiply that by 10 um, when you're talking about rural communities. For example, access to health care. I mean, you have communities, one of the fights that we did for 10 years in, um, in, in Dallas County in what we call the Black Belt of, 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 of Alabama, which for some people, they would say, if you carved out the black belt in Alabama, Alabama becomes a state that's probably uh, ranked higher um, in terms of quality of life, quality of education. But the black belt and what's happening in those rural communities is enough to make it be fiftieth or fifty. You know, 50, you know. So um, we wanted to make sure that we did not neglect voters in those communities, that we wanted to find a way to amplify their concerns, amplify their needs, and tie them and link them into the national concerns or the statewide concerns. Um, I think Stacey Abrams was excellent. I think she also prioritized a full statewide approach even when she ran for office, which, you know, most people don't do. I mean, usually you target communities that you think can help get you elected. But I was very excited that um, she also prioritized going, doing a full state focus and emphasis because all, you know, all, all voters matter. So we wanted to make sure that we, we amplify that. So we don't just do it in Georgia. Everywhere we go, 
we try to make sure that we target communities um, that are in these rural areas to bring them to the conversations, to bring them to a lot of the, seat, a lot of the tables that are in states, and make sure those voices are heard as well. Nancy, uh, a follow-up question for you. I, I haven't uh, admittedly read all of Judge Hinkle's order between the end of Manuel's happy hour last night and the beginning <laughs> of breakfast this morning. It's a 55-page order. But uh, the part I was able to read at the end seemed to leave the door open to relief if you can identify further uh, victims in the similar situation. Can you talk about what might be the next steps immediately going forward um, in, in that case and, and in general in Florida? Sure. So I don't have the manual's excuse. I just, it's 55 pages. So I'm still <laughs> digesting some of the order. But yeah, I think that, you know, the court again really focused on ability to pay. Now, because we're amongst friends, I'll share that I have some reservations about that standard also. Because ability to pay what? Ability to pay, like in one of my client's situations, write a check for $14,000 before the presidential primary or $50 a month for the rest of her life. Because if it's the latter, then she still won't ever be able to pay. So that's problematic. But yes, the, and then so one of the cases were one of five cases consolidated um, in this challenge. And one of them was styled as a class action. And during the a hearing last week in Tallahassee, the court really pushed us on how would you define the class? Because if it's everyone who can't, who lacks the ability to pay, how is that a class when you're really going person by person? And again, you're talking about 1.4 million people who we maintain were, you know, eligible after the law's passage in November to vote. So I think that even though, again, it is a victory, our clients are going to be able to vote in the presidential pr uh, primaries. But I think that, you know, we still need to really carefully look at what the court is signaling to us as to what a class definition should look like and how we continue to advance this issue because I believe that at some point we're going to have to just take on these kind of poll tax cases head on. Get winning these, having these piecemeal victories, are, it's important, again, as we see that in terms of the trajectory of similar um, legal movements. We know that it's an important first or second step, but at the end of the day, requiring someone to pay in order to vote, we thought was already outlawed in the Constitution, mm. and we're just dealing with it in a new way, um, and, and we can't be afraid. So I agree. Being able to take perhaps um, the lower hanging fruit in terms of cases in the voting rights context context is important, but we can't shy away from right. taking on the big battle, right. knocking down that big old tree. Indeed, indeed. Uh, Jackie, you mentioned briefly the census case that uh, most people in the room are probably uh, somewhat familiar with, where the Supreme Court, by the narrowest of margins last June, uh, decided that it was not okay to add uh, a citizenship question to the long census form, and there was some question about whether the Trump administration was going to uh, try to fix that on remand and uh, add it nonetheless. They ultimately decided not to, and it has come out in recent weeks that the Census Bureau is trying to generate the same data through other means. Um, and they intend to release, uh, release that uh, as an uh, accompaniment file to the redistricting data, which will not be used for apportionment, but for uh, drawing district, or potentially used for drawing district lines. Can you talk at all about, about that aspect of the citizenship issue and census data? Uh, yes, um, some of the things that, that we do know is, is such a, a when I had mentioned that the damage had been done, uh, you can see that even though they've lost certain cases in the courts, that they're continuing to throw out there and, and, and do these scare tactics. Uh, we're absolutely being very vigilant uh, and, and watching everything closely. One of the things, too, that came out in the news um, that we've been watching, too, uh, which is not new, is part of that executive order, 
was in regards to the information that they're trying to go after the DMV, right? Each department, each, uh, each mm -hmm. state. The wonderful thing about that is that is uh, not mandatory and is optional. And most states are not given information to, right. to the feds. That's the, what we're seeing uh, right now. And then on top of that, they have to sign uh, an agreement that it has to be confidential. So in other words, uh, the, each state has a right whether they want to share it or not. It looks like most are not. Uh, so that's a good thing, uh, but we're still continuing to be very vigilant. And with the census, it is so sensitive because in the one hand, you want to have our legal minds staying on top of everything, right? Watching their every move, we have to stay on top of it. And yet we have the advocates uh, saying to our community, you must be counted, you must be counted because we need to make sure we have representation and we need those dollars to come. So what, what a predicament that the situation that we're in, where we're wanting to make sure that, that our community is educated on what's happening, uh, all the things that are being thrown at us, and yet also being able to say uh, that. And so Title 13 uh, is really important uh, because that's where we're, we're, we have to make sure that, that folks know uh, what the Constitution <coughs> says and, what the, and, and amendments. And I think that that's where, where the power of our community is going to be based on the educating, but we're continuing to be vigilant. And Naleo works very closely with the ACLU, with uh, Latino Justice, with all these organizations, common cause of making sure that, uh, that we're watching it closely. But again, it's, uh, it's something that it's volunteer. Uh, folks, uh, each state volunteers whether they're going to give that information. So just to add to that, I, I was um, one of the attorneys on the exact match case last uh, fall before the 2018 election, there was another big case uh, similar to it out of Texas. And the issue there is that uh, DMV citizenship data is grossly out of date because uh, they, they do track citizenship as of when you apply for your driver's license. And it's possible in, in I believe, every state for a non-citizen legal resident to get a uh, a driver's license, but they don't track when those people become naturalized. And so Texas and Georgia ended up um, trying to disfranchise uh, thousands and thousands of people, citizens, who had become naturalized since the time of their, uh, their um, driver's license application. And that means uh, that um, to the extent that the administration is going to use that data to uh, produce citizenship numbers, it could be uh, completely wholly with errors. Uh, and it's something that I think we all need to be vigilant about. Is DMV the only, because, you know, I, I'm, if I'm familiar with thinking about the same Texas case and the, the court didn't necessarily deal with the ultimate question about whether you can use these other sources, um, not just the DMV, but potentially, you know, information related to voter rolls and things of that nature, when you're talking about redistricting, not reproportionate, but I'm just, you know, where, where, are the, where is the court with them relying on additional data to, 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 form, to, be, you know, to inform what these lines will ultimately look like, even though you have census information? Well, the Supreme Court in Evenwell left that question wide they open. They left it wide open. Wide and so, open. you know, I don't think, you know, we that are doing this on the groundwork are really aware about the distinction that you made as it relates to federal money coming versus how you're drawing lines. And... And I thought it was very telling that the Supreme Court did just kind of leave that open and the administration just kind of pulled back because to me it signaled we were going to do it, you know. Um, so I, I think we, we really, I'm very concerned about that. Yeah, yeah, I am as well. Uh, Bruce, one follow-up from you and if we could get a quick answer because I want the audience to have an opportunity to, uh, to ask questions as well. Uh, you mentioned the ballot marking devices. And those are, I think, probably relatively new for most people. Uh, can you talk a little bit about, about how Georgia came to uh, decide on those and, and what uh, the problem is with those, in your view? Sure. The, uh, after uh, Judge Totenberg's um, opinion in 2018, saying that the state better do something uh, to fix their election system, uh, the state legislature had a commission look at uh, different voting systems um, to purchase for the entire state. And um, against the recommendation of the only computer uh, 
literate person on their commission, uh, the state voted to purchase these ballot marking device systems. And what the ballot marking device is, is that it's like a little tablet where you, um, like the, the uh, plastic screen that you all are probably familiar with, but it's on a tablet, and so you, you mash your vote on the, on the tablet except on the screen. It's better because it also prints out a sort of receipt for you. And then you take that receipt and you put it into the scanner. And so you can look at the receipt and say, oh, yeah, I voted for so-and-so or this ballot measure forever and put it in there. The problem with that is that you still don't, it's still going into a computer. And so you don't know, and the computer is not reading what you did. It's reading some either a barcode or some sort of electronic signal. And so it's really not that we don't think it's that much better uh, than the voting. It is a little bit better because you do have some artifact of uh, your vote. But the problem with that, all of our experts say, and I mean all of them say, is that the fact that you have a computer between the person and the permanent record of their vote, it's going to be a problem no matter what uh, because you cannot um, authoritatively verify the election results. What you do in an audit is that you do what's called a risk limiting audit, which is, was invented by our expert, which helps. Um, in a risk li limiting audit, um, you say we're going to take for hand marked paper ballots, which is what we're promoting. For hand marked paper ballots, you, if the vote is um, not very close, let's say, you don't have to go through all of them, right? You don't have to recount it. Uh, but there's statistical things where you get a very high, uh, so you can, you can have, you can do a sampling of your artifacts and it can be accurate. And if it's very close, you may have to count them all, okay? But you will know at the end of the day who won the election. You will know at the end of the day who, who won the election. With the ballot marking devices, if there's, if there's a programming error, whether it's innocent or malicious, the artifacts are not going to be as reliable because people don't check them. The, all the evidence is, is that if, if when you vote, you have 20 things on there, people are not going to check it, check it over. And if it's wrong, there's no feedback mechanism to fix it. So those are the two problems with that. And so that's, and I think the judge is not, has not indicated if she's receptive to that argument or not, but we, we think she should be. So. Great. Thank you. Well, let's open it up for questions. We've got a few, few, time for a few. I see a hand back there in the green shirt. Yeah, you. Thank you. Thank you. Just uh a few really quick ones. I'm uh, the policy counsel for the Arab American Institute. Uh, so just two questions. One, what's the role of language access in all the work that uh, you, you all do? And then uh, two, the Arab American community uh, seldom has positive interactions with the government. And so I'm wondering if, <laughs> I'm wondering uh, what are techniques to try to encourage communities like that to affirmatively approach the government, give them information, whether registering to vote, or, or getting counted for the, for the census. And just a really quick plug, we run the Yellow Vote campaign and the Yellow Count Me In campaign. Um, so if you're interested, see me about those. Thank you. Who wants, who wants to take that one on? Jackie, are you doing language uh, We sure do. Outreach? <laughs> With, uh, when it comes to, um, we've been working, well, so there was a, just a case that, that uh, as you folks know, in the state of Florida where uh, it's mandatory now. Uh, to make sure that that um, that it reflects the language of the community in, in this particular case with Spanish, um, and um, and so that's really a huge. W regarding the census, uh, also uh, in in many languages too, where folks, uh, especially our, our elderly who are not working with computers and are not working that, they're also able to call and actually be able to be counted by phone in the language of their hmm. uh, that they're. Uh, also comfortable that that's that's wonderful, you know, because then folks have that access. Uh, in regards to how we're working closely, I believe you might have asked in regards to our other other communities, um, Naleo, especially myself. Um, I grew up in Jersey, and so we're a melting pot up there. And so I work very closely, uh, even though we're the National Association of Latinos elected officials. I think that there is there is uh, power in numbers, and then also all of us working together. So we work very closely. Uh, with CARE and with a lot of the organizations, our, our, our um, Muslim community uh, in, uh, in Central Florida and also in South Florida. Um, 
because I think that that's really where the, where the strength is. We can't do it by ourselves. Uh, we just had a press conference regarding uh, for National Voter Registration Day, and it was about 20 organizations, and we had our Asian community, our pastors, our, uh, uh, our Muslim community, uh, and I think that it was such a nice uh, representation, a reflection of who we are. And I think that that's where our, I've noticed that more than ever with all these things that have happened that are controversial, it has brought us all even closer together. Uh, so which is, they better watch out <laughs> because we are able to use our strengths together. Great. Right, right here. We have a question in the back. Oh, okay. Go ahead. Sure, sure. Okay. Um, yes, I just want to uh, thank the panel for coming out and speaking with us. Uh, so, quick question, as far as restoration of rights, uh, you mentioned some um, arguments that have been made. How viable it, would it be to argue that, um, although, that the, although the statute appears facially neutral, it disproportionately affects a certain class, i.e. minorities or women, and thus should be uh, uh, analyzed under strict scrutiny? Nancy, you want to handle that? Sure. Um, I mean, so number one, right, the legal standard is extremely important. Generally, when you're talking about the 14th Amendment and voting rights cases, the court has created what they call the sliding scale in terms of the balance of the interest. But we are pushing for even stricter standard than that. Um, you know, and going through the court's opinion quickly, I didn't see a, any language or very little talking about low income or economic class but just again this general language about ability to pay but for sure the heart of our cases is about um, the particular communities that are going to be most impacted so we're going to even though the court didn't mention that in its in its order on the preliminary injunction it's something that we're going to be pursuing as we gear up for for trial in the case Can you hear me? Yeah. Yes. <laughs> Your statement of the plaintiff's burden in a voting rights case sounded to me as if it would invalidate Georgia's uh, exact match law. Has yes. that been litigated, or what are the prospects for that? Um, uh, Sean Young and the ACLU actually has, has um, done a lot of damage to the exact match law, I think. Right, Brian? I mean, you're involved. You've, yeah, you know I, I'm involved in that case. Um, and, and with the lawyers committee, I, yeah. Sean, I don't know if you have a piece of that or or, or not. Yeah, um, there was there's plenty of litig litigation to go around last yeah. fall. <laughs> <laughs> um, so so um, we do have a a claim under that that piece of, uh, of the Fourteenth Amendment that strand of equal protection law. We um, we won a case in that's similar to that. Uh, involving absentee absentee ballots, um, which is a which is an area that that is is going to be increasingly important because a lot of people are taking advantage of absentee absentee voting, um, and the way that Georgia was matching up an absentee ballot with their record of someone's signature uh, was a problem, and and we we got a order under a procedural due process sort of angle that the state before it rejected somebody because their signature didn't match had to do more than they were doing which was just basically tossing them out willy-nilly uh, and then the other the and the feature of that was um, in this was one of the cases that I have where the discriminatory impact was important uh, because uh, people who's um, who learned how to write English uh, their name in English after they learned how to write um, will not retain their signature the same way that people who did learn um, how to write their name in, in their current language if um, they're not European. Um, and so if you're French and you emigrate, no offense, if you're French and you emigrate to the United States, your signature is going to be the same. Uh, but not if you're, not if you're Korean, uh, not, if, not if you're uh, Vietnamese. And so when we were looking at the, at the, uh, the list from Gwinnett County of the of the absentee votes that were rejected because of signature. So I'll, I immediately went to look at it to see if there was a Brown. My last name is Brown. It's the fifth most common name in the country. No Browns were rejected. Mm. Okay, you go to Gwen, you know, N-G-U-Y-E-N, -E a, a very, very common Vietnamese name. Gwen, 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 Gwen. Mm -hmm. And so you just look at it, and that's what we explain. It's a judge, look, this isn't fair. So we didn't, 
we didn't really win because it was having a discriminatory impact. We won because they didn't go through the process for anybody uh, to do it fairly. Signature I, matching is a huge yeah. problem. It is. Yeah, may, may I add just really quickly? Um, I sat on the canvassing board as a commissioner, and that was one of our biggest concerns, and that's part of what we need to educate our community of making sure that their signature uh, is not rejected, so to let them know not to just scribble because yeah. their vote could easily just be yeah. dismissed. And so we had to go into a full force of educating our community um, that you must make sure that your signature matches, which is so unfair of what's happening because a lot of the votes are being rejected. One more question? Okay, right, straight ahead. Uh, this question is for Nancy. Uh, Nancy, you talked about both how uh, fines and fees in the criminal justice system uh, disenfranchise uh, people, uh, but also how uh, photo ID disenfranchises people. I'm wondering if there's any work being done on the intersection of those two things, and I'm thinking particularly how uh, failure to pay fines, fees, and child support oftentimes lead to driver's license suspensions, and how that makes it harder for people to vote, and if there's any work on that being done. Yeah, absolutely. And so this goes to your raising the creativity of um, states in responding to negative court decisions. So a lot of the early photo ID cases we were able to win because you had to pay a fee to vote to get the ID. And so the courts, uh, the states made the IDs free, but they required that you provide underlying documents which weren't free. And so we said, well, you still have to pay for a birth certificate. So we've tried to say there are fees involved pretty much in every step of the process. So we've tried to push that forward. And it's also interesting that you mentioned child support because we had a case um, when I was with the ACLU national office against the state of Tennessee that not only required payment of court costs and fines and restitution, but also required individuals to be current on child support in order to be able to vote. And although I got a great decision out of the Sixth Circuit in terms of a dissent, that decision, I got a great dissent, um, we still ultimately lost that case because the court said, well, you know, again, expanding this definition of what costs are associated with one sentence. So that's why this area is so dangerous. But absolutely, I think, again, the the issue of cost is why we need to really push back um, and having that be a barrier at all, regardless of one's ability to pay. I want to add one more thing. I know we need to get lunch, but in response to the question about the um, exact match, is that one of the keys to um, successful litigation in this area is that if you're challenging a voting um, process, the first thing that you have to say is that we yield to no person uh, in our vigilance in protecting against voter fraud, okay? So you have to be first off as a matter of things that we, we want less than the state does to make sure that nobody's defrauding. So you have to start out by saying that, period. Now let's look at the way you, you do this. Uh, because if you don't say that and spend some time saying that, then you just think, look, the, the plaintiff is just trying to let people vote fraudulently. Mm -hmm. The second thing is that very idea may be the way that we defeat the BMDs, and this is why. If you have a machine that's not malfunctioning, that is malfunctioning in a precinct, let's say that is 90% African American, okay? You get somebody in there who's gonna say, the machine's not working. The machine's not working. We gotta take it offline. Someone else comes in there and says, this one's not working either. Look, I voted for Smith, and it says, it says Brown on my receipt. Next person comes in and says the same thing. You could have a, you could have a very, easy system of disenfranchising that entire precinct by people coming in and falsely claiming that the machines aren't working and there's nothing you can do about it. You can't, there's no record of his vote, so you can never disprove that he's wrong. So you're in an endless loop of, of and, and what you have to do is you think, okay, we fix this problem. This gets back to what uh, April was saying. We fix this problem. How are they gonna try to screw you next time? Mm -hmm. Okay, you gotta think ahead of that. So, and, I, and that's and, and I'm real quick. And that's the issue with the computerized, right? Yeah, so you go back yeah. to paper ballots. Yeah, that's. But that's, we talk about now. We know that a lot of marginalized communities they get one or two boxes. Right. Right. And right. so even though it's electronic, now at going back to 
paper ballots. What is that going to look like? What are the lines going to look like for those ballots? I mean, are we going to, you know, is it going to double the impact of possibly people not being able to vote before yep. 8 o'clock, for example? So yep. it's just that careful, you know, that careful balance that we have to play. So on that t utterly terrifying <laughs> note from, uh, from Bruce, uh, join me in thanking the rest of the panel.